Hello, everyone. Hi, Frank. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm joining you uh, directly from Munich, uh, where, uh, yeah, my colleagues and I are working on our mission uh, to, to sustainably connect the world through pioneering and uh, through green aerospace technology. Now, you, you, Frank, you're one of the assets of the European Space Agency. So uh, let me start on a relatable note. At Airbus, you know, we make things fly and satellites are definitely no, no exception to that. Uh, these products are totally awesome. Their value is so tangible. Without satellite communications, you know, we just couldn't be doing what we're doing now. We're colleagues on the various Airbus sites across the world and participating to a great conference in Berlin on the same day or simply just working from home like probably many of us did throughout the past months. And, um, you know, we, we literally, at Airbus, we literally work on connecting the world um, literally and physically with, with our aircraft. And... Um, Having the privilege of serving the company as the chief technology officer, it is definitely my responsibility, my duty to drive the Airbus ambition to build the future of flight. And, you know, you may ask, well, Grazia, tell us all about it. What does the future of flight look like? And very simply put, Frank, it's a future in which air transportation is sustainable, is climate neutral. Now, I won't, um, don't underestimate the, 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 this, this, this task, this goal. Achieving it is incredibly complex. We need to develop many different uh, technologies all at the same time, coherently and, and concurrently. And the only way to master this complexity is, of course, to bring in, combine the expertise, the experience of many different people. Inside Airbus, we have a great innovation team spread uh, all over the globe in Europe, Asia, China, and the Americas, and well beyond that. So one could say, as CTO of Airbus, my daily job is to unleash the potential of technology by unleashing the potential of talents. The first step to connecting the world is, is to connect with people. And since really the key objective here is to harness, to explore technologies that will bring us closer to a zero emission future of flight, I am particularly delighted to be able to connect with the Green Tech Conference and the whole community here, here today. So thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much, Gracia. Um, it's a difficult time for everybody. We see that at the event, people sitting uh, apart. We cannot socialize and discuss uh, about the innovation that we uh, should do. And which brings us normally a lot of people maybe would travel here. And some of them would travel also in business class. So will business class still exist? So I think you are the person to ask because it's not only Lufthansa questioning, but, but everybody. Is that, is that the business model of the future? What will change? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely a question, uh, a question big on our minds. I mean, it was almost half a year ago, right, that, uh, that the World Health Organization officially declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And without any doubt, our industry, all about global mobility and exchange, aviation as a whole, is one of the fields that was definitely most severely hit by the crisis. In the past months, worldwide air traffic fell by over 90% from his peak, its peak. So that's, that's enormous. What does this concretely mean for the future of aviation, for Airbus? And well, also, you know, what's in it for me? What, how will my role change, if at all, and my responsibilities as CTO? Well, if I had joined Green Tech last year, uh, we would be here debating uh, on, you know, how can the aviation industry manage to balance the exponentially growing demand with its environmental um, impact, right? Uh, yeah. Well, today the questions are quite different, right? Uh, as you just uh, as you just stated uh, or asked, is the underlying business model of aviation still intact? And even if if this is the case, I get very often uh, skeptical questions like. 
are you really still committed to, you know, bold ambition to decarbonize aviation at all? Well, these are really the core questions, um, which if you allow me, Frank, I'd like to tackle front, frontally right away with a resounding yes to both, to both questions. And you said that very nicely, decarbonizing aerospace. Yeah. And maybe we can go on that a little bit because I think this drives the people also here in the audience, but also on the streaming channels. Uh, and the people say decarbonizing aerospace and that's Airbus. And now we have to ask them, is the commitment still valid? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So is the, air, is the air, aerospace industry as a whole, because indeed it's not only aviation, it's also satellite, and you, had, you made a great point in your impulse on, on, uh, on um, debris. Um, the, the aerospace, is the aerospace industry still committed to the ambition to invest in green technologies and to protect our climate and environment, or are we rather focusing on regaining profitability? Well, we need to be crystal clear here, Frank. This is a false choice because there will not be a sustainable industry profit without climate protection. This won't go away. Already before the crisis, it had been common sense, right? That preserving the climate, preserving the environment is the foundation upon which to build the future of aviation, ecologically and economically. And COVID-19 has only increased, uh, in my view, this global awareness of how truly dependent we are on a healthy environment. And you see, Consequently, um, all recent economic stimulus plans of European governments and even of the European Union, well, they're all coming, we're discussing, they're all coming with green strings attached. Uh, just yesterday, in her State of the Union address, EU Commission President von der Leyen revealed that the e um, European Commission is proposing to increase the 2030 target for emissions reduction to 55%. Now, if I'm not mistaken, 30% of that 750 billion next generation euro budget will be raised through green bonds. And 37% of that funding will be invested in European Green Deal objectives, including Lighthouse European projects such as hydrogen, um, green building, and uh, I think in the pack you, you have 1 million um, charging points as well. So, all these developments make it really clear that the societal, political pressure for green solutions is constantly rising. And if you ask me, it will rise further when we get out of this crisis. Because if airlines reduce fleets and retire the older and more inefficient uh, aircraft in the crisis, well, they were gonna need new aircraft when air travel picks up again. Mm -hmm. But uh, then they will only buy the most eco-efficient aircraft on the market, saving them from costs, from fuel, and mitigating the risk of future, uh, future taxes, eco-tax and regulations. Mm -hmm. So for ecological responsibility, but also, back to my previous point, for economic rationality, we remain fully committed to, to our sustainability goals. And this commitment is not just talk, it materializes in a very tangible ambition to bring a zero emission aircraft to market in, in our lifetime. We, we're convinced that carbon neutral aviation is not only technologically possible, but it is achievable within our lifetime. And our ambition at Airbus, indeed, is to develop the world's first zero-emission commercial aircraft by 2035, enabling future generations to enjoy flying just as much as we do in harmony with the environment. And along this line, we started already well before the crisis exploring very disruptive technologies and concepts um, since aircraft are among the most complex products in the world, we need to pull many levers uh, concurrently to decarbonize aviation and to enable to fly uh, in a climate neutral way. 
we need to push for aerodynamic advanced structures, for smart, recyclable materials. We need to start thinking about our product end-to-end. -end. Complete life cycle assessments will be the baseline. We need to push for alternative fuels, even if it won't be us, uh, you know, in, in the front, on the front line layer. Um, and we're going to need to push for alternative propulsion and its certification, of course, in full safety, keeping safety always at the top of all what we do. Uh, very often forgotten, we need to push also for more automated air traffic management to explore new fields um, in this sense, applying artificial intelligence and even one day maybe quantum computing to managing the airspace, optimizing it to avoid, it can have a significant, significant impact on, uh, on the reduction of emissions. So avoiding emission as much as we can. Gracia, now, you, you mentioned already some yeah. interesting technologies uh, and uh, yeah. who not else to ask than the CTO of Airbus. Is there something which maybe is not on our radar but is on your radar and you can leak without getting any problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. Um, let me give you a sneak preview. Um, in just a few days, um, more precisely, next Monday, we're going to be uh, revealing uh, details around our ideas of a zero emission aircraft to the wider public. Now, I cannot unveil too much today, okay? But I, I can give you just a, a little teaser on one, on one selected on one topic, if you allow me to, uh, and I heard already a lot about it in the previous uh, in the previous discussions. One key thing is that at Airbus we firmly believe that hydrogen is one of the most promising technology pathways that holds exceptional promises as a clean aviation fuel. Why? Well, there's many different reasons. If you generate hydrogen from renewable energy sources, it can truly be a zero emission fuel. Uh, we really think hydrogen could contribute for over 50% to our journey towards climate neutral flight. Furthermore, while well, hydrogen is already um, in use in, in various sectors, and on top of that, if we start with scale production of green hydrogen, the costs would reasonably be expected to fall significantly. Mm -hmm. And with this lower barrier to entry, um, hydrogen, sustainable hydrogen, would also become available for many other industries too. All in all, hydrogen holds really a rich potential, presenting us the unique opportunity for the world to reduce emissions and increase also future global competitiveness. Every such radical chance bears its challenges. So technically, we're going to need to adapt, of course, the way we design aircraft. It won't just be able, we won't be able just to retrofit something like, um, for, for instance, a propulsion based on hydrogen. Um, if we use hydrogen as a power source, we need to design our aircraft around it. And we, um, we face questions like storage in tanks, uh, uh, storage, the, the temperature, of course. We need to cool it down to below 250 degrees Celsius. And we need to compress it to bring it, for, for instance, to bring oxygen uh, at the right uh, pressure to the fuel cells. So a lot of technical questions still to be, of course, solved. Logistically, we're going to need to find ways to produce it uh, at industrial scale and to make it also disposable at global level, starting with the airport infrastructure. And uh, for a true global transition to hydrogen, we also need something more global. We need to globally adapt um, policies and regulations. And you know, well, if, if we look at, at where the world is today, we probably agree that global coordination of policies can sometimes be tricky to, to be euphemistic. Um, now, each of these challenges I mentioned, I mentioned technology, logistics, the regulation aspects, they can only be solved if all stakeholders determinedly work together. Politics, industry, academia, research institutions. You know, the, the recent 
announcement of France and Germany to jointly invest 16 billion in a hydrogen strategy, well, isn't that a strong starting point for such a common effort? You're a very... Um, this, yeah. Yeah, well, you're very strong players, Airbus, and there's a nice Irish saying which says, on the shoulders of the giants you see further. So you are a giant in your industry, and uh, on the, the people who want to climb on the shoulders are the startups, some of them we have seen today. So when I have you now on the line, what is the advice giving to the startups, having maybe solutions and technologies, um, how they would address uh, also Airbus? Because uh, you drive innovation and you don't do that alone. What do you give them as the advice helping you on that journey? Well, we, we do interact with, uh, with a lot of, of startups or even former startups um, who are now stepping into, let's say, a more type of industrial reality and are struggling to keep you know, their startup uh, mentality, mindset and all. What, if, what is positive of being absolutely agile and free and creative with you know the need to structure more their thinking around getting things out to the market we interact with many we advise many and also we leverage on many um, on many startups uh, and on their uh, on their developments and thinking um, so we're fully complementary in this sense uh, Airbus was born as a startup 50, 50 years ago. Uh, now uh, we, we grew uh, beyond, uh, beyond that phase, uh, but there is really room for all size in this, in this uh, context does not matter, okay? And the, the biggest uh, frameworks like the, the European clean aviation framework is designed really to... Um, to have contributors not only from the industry but also from from the startup world. So, uh, so guys, girls, uh, stick to it. Stick to your dreams and and continue relentlessly on your entrepreneurial path. It does take uh, a lot of uh, a lot of resilience, um, and uh, definitely this crisis is putting a strain on all of us. But uh, there there's place for all. We need all. The challenge is such that there will not be, you know, the silver bullet uh, solution coming from one key player. So the game is open. Excellent. We're nearly done. Uh, time was flying. Um, so to the audience uh, on the streaming channels, make use about that. Uh, it's climbing on the shoulders of the giants really helped to make your dreams flying. Um, I, I prepared five small sentences which I would like you to close. We have roughly two minutes. And, uh, and then when we have time left over, I have another one. But uh, be very open, uh, and it's not scripted. Uh? This is not scripted, it's really live, uh, because otherwise it's also not entertaining for you. So when we see, our kids in 29 years will travel to... And you have we'll to... Will travel the, to? Yeah, you have to, uh, to end the sentence. So I start the sentence and you have to end yes. it. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. It's, yes. A, it's to, funny. to discover... To discover, to discover the world, to connect with different cultures, because it is by connecting with different cultures that we appreciate differences and uh, create the best uh, possible environment for a peaceful world. Good. The biggest challenge in aviation in 20 years will be... <laughs> Sticking to our commitments and uh, demonstrating that zero emission flying is a reality. Very good. In 2020, uh, 2050, Airbus will be... Flourishing, zero emission, embracing the perfect balance of the equation between societal responsibility, financial interest, profitability, and environmental Good. protection. Space will become? Clean. We will have wonderful means to not only avoid debris in space, but actively clean it up and enable even more extraplanetary missions. Thank you so much. Applause to Grazia that she was joining with us. We hope you see her live next year. Thank you so much.
and see you in live soon. Thank you.